In this unit, we're going to talk about the chemistry of the transition metals, that sort of enigmatic block in the middle of the periodic table, where we find these elements that don't exactly follow the patterns in reactivity and properties that we see in the main group elements, which are on the edges, groups 1 and 2, and then groups 13 through 18. But the transition metals have a lot of very interesting and practically useful and practically important chemistry. And we're going to look at that in this unit and focus on coordination chemistry, which is a very important sort of reactivity mode for transition metals in which the metal typically acts as a Lewis acid and non-metal or organic ligands coordinate to the Lewis acidic metal center, creating coordinate covalent or dative bonds. Coordination compounds have, again, a lot of important practical applications, but can also teach us a lot about structure. So we'll dig into isomerism. We'll see what happens when a molecule is handed, not identical to its mirror image, and look at molecules that are related but via their spatial properties. They have the same atoms and bonds, but, but differ in their spatial properties. And we'll really get under the hood of the structures of coordination compounds, ultimately developing a model of orbitals in a coordination complex, specifically the d orbitals at the metal center that allows us to explain the magnetic properties and the colors of coordination compounds. So we're going to look first at the general properties of the transition metals and compounds that they form. Then we're going to move into discussing coordination chemistry, talk about how we think about coordination compounds and coordination complexes within those compounds. And then we'll look at the spectroscopic and magnetic properties of coordination compounds and develop a model known as crystal field theory to explain the color and magnetic properties of these compounds. All right, let's start with the occurrence, preparation, and properties of the transition metals and their compounds. Now, on the periodic table, the transition metals are found in the center, in groups 3 through 12, as well as the sort of cutout that comes in the bottom half of the transition series. So all of these we would consider transition metals. Now, these that are cut out, as we'll see shortly, are very different um, because they're in the F block from those that show up above. Generally, we refer to this block of the periodic table as the D block, since the valence electrons in those neutral atoms and their cations are D electrons, whereas this block is referred to as the F block because the valence electrons in cations of these elements are in F orbitals. And D and F orbitals look very different, generally look more complicated, have more lobes, that kind of thing, than S and P orbitals, which are the valence orbitals in the main group. And this gives rise to important differences in properties between the transition elements and the main group elements. Now, group 12, I'll just mention, is often referred to as the post-transition metal group, because this group, when those atoms are neutral, has a, a full D subshell, right? I've got D10 when I'm here at zinc and I'm about to make the transition into the main group with gallium. So these are often called post-transition metals because that full D subshell in the neutral atom makes these a little bit more main group-like, we might say. And this reference has more information on that characterization of group 12 as the post-transition metals if you'd like to learn more. The F block elements are called the lanthanides and actinides. The first row is called lanthanides due to the resemblance of these elements to lanthanum. They all have similar properties, and this is a theme throughout the transition series, that the properties of all of these elements are much more similar than elements that are, for example, next to each other in the main group. Um, oxygen and fluorine are very, very different from each other, much more different from each other than, for example, lanthanum and cerium, which are quite similar in their properties. So this first row is referred to as the lanthanides or lanthanoids, and the second row is referred to as the actinides or actinoids due to the resemblance of all of these elements to actinium, the first element in that second row of the F block. Now, we'll touch on this in more detail shortly as to the reasons why, but I wanted to note here as a general point now that when the transition metals and the lanthanides and actinides form cations, it's the D and F orbitals that are filled with electrons. The S orbitals find themselves empty, even though the S orbitals appear to come quote unquote first on the periodic table. We'll dig into the reasons why that is, but for the time being, I just wanted to make the general note that electron configurations for transition metal cations, as well as lanthanides and actinides, contain only D and F electrons. In thinking about the elements themselves, the elemental metals, transition metals, have properties that really reflect the properties of metals 
more broadly. They're reducing agents from decent to not so great, I would say. They're not as fantastic as, say, a lithium or a magnesium in terms of reducing power, and they can vary a lot. They're electrically and thermally conductive. They, for example, can conduct electricity and, and heat very easily. They're hard, high melting solids. They're solids at room temperature across the board, uh, with the exception of mercury, I suppose. And then they form cations and what we'll call coordination compounds. They're generally Lewis acidic. Because they're decent reducing agents, they're okay with giving up or donating electrons and forming cations. And those cations are Lewis acidic and can form coordination compounds. And that's going to form a huge chunk of what we talk about in this unit. Let's talk about periodic trends in the transition series. We've seen from the main group previously that electronegativity generally increases left to right across a period, and atomic radius generally decreases left to right. And both of these effects are ultimately due to an increase in the effective nuclear charge, Z effective, felt by the valence electrons as we add more protons to the nucleus of the atom. The, the sort of changes here are not as dramatic in some cases as you might see in the main group, and there are some exceptions because the d orbitals are funky. But generally speaking, as a rule, you want to have the general idea that electronegativity increases left to right and atomic radius decreases left to right. As we look down a group with atomic radius, something really interesting occurs between the second and third rows of the transition series. And I wanted to jump over to the periodic table to look at this. So this is between groups five and six. And let's pull up the atomic radii, the empirical radii, if we can, for all of these elements. So what we would expect moving down a group is that the atomic radius would increase, right? Because we're adding additional shells to the atom. Adding a fifth shell, adding a sixth shell should enlarge the size of the atom since the 5d orbitals are farther from the nucleus than the 4d orbitals are, for example. But something we can notice is that that trend is, is actually sort of bucked by the transition metals a, a great deal. So if we look at these empirical radii, for example, you can see sort of what we would expect in vanadium and niobium with an increase of about 10 picometers in going from the first row to the second row of the transition series. But tantalum has the same radius as niobium. This is odd. The radius of tungsten is even smaller than that of molybdenum. The radius of platinum is smaller than that of palladium. What's going on here, right? This is These trends down a group in atomic radii are very, very funky looking. And in fact, pretty much regardless of, of how you look at this, the covalent radii, they all follow a very similar trend. And the covalent radii really drive this point home that it's between the second and third rows where the increase in atomic radius is much, much less than we would expect or actually completely non-existent, right? Only a couple of picometers and in some cases even a decrease from palladium to platinum as we move down a group. What in the world is going on here? Well, the key is to notice that in the sixth row, we have elements 57 through 71, the lanthanides that are shoved between the second and third rows of the transition series. So we've got a whole collection of elements that we have between the second and third rows of the D block that are going to have an effect on the atomic radius. And as we move across the lanthanides, the decrease in atomic radius is dramatic. And I have that back on the slide. There's a rather unexpectedly large drop in radius across the F block of the periodic table. This is what's known as the lanthanide contraction. And we can see it in this figure. Lanthanum here at 195 picometers. And as we move left to right, we get a decrease to about 175 picometers for lutetium. So 20 picometers decrease as we move across the lanthanides. And keep in mind, all of these elements are shoved between that second and third row of the transition series. And so by the time we hit the third row, there's been a significant contraction in atomic radius, which is going to be counterbalanced to some extent by moving down to the next row but not completely. So what we find overall is that period five and six transition metals, those elements in the second and third rows of the transition series, the elements that are here and here, 
have relatively similar radii to each other. And this is due to the so-called lanthanide contraction, the rather dramatic decrease in atomic radius observed across the lanthanide series. So period five and six transition metals have similar radii. This is important to keep in mind when you're comparing atomic radii of transition metals that are in the same group, but in different periods.